This week, something that I've been waiting for for a long time finally came to pass. I've been waiting for months. That's right. I got my vaccine. And uh, for months we've been waiting for this vaccine and there are lots of things I don't particularly like about getting older, but there are a few advantages. I was waiting for the news to clock down when I might be in the age bracket to receive the vaccine. And sure enough, I did this week. You see, the vaccine for many of us, uh, and not just the vaccine, but as restrictions uh, start to become freer and freer, we realise that we are emerging into a new season. It feels like we get to engage in the rebuilding of our lives. For many of us, this last few months, in fact, over a year now, has been a devastating time. We've lost loved ones. We ourselves have experienced great difficulties in isolation, economically, all kinds of things that we have struggled with. But the vaccine and those of us who've been able, to, uh, who've been offered it, but not just that, like I said, the, the restrictions easing up gives us a hope for a new future. We're rebuilding life again. So the question I wanna ask us today is how do we begin the rebuilding? And we're gonna be taking our lead over the next few weeks from the book of Nehemiah. It's one of two books uh, that actually in our Bibles are uh, separate, separate Ezra and Nehemiah, but for many, many years they were the same, uh, same book. And, and there are about five books in the Old Testament that speak to rebuilding. Let me help you uh, understand where Nehemiah fits in the whole history of our Christian heritage. Well, the first thing is that if you remember, King David looked after the whole of Israel. A united Israel under King David, the promised land that they've been seeking uh, uh, under Moses, the one that had been promised uh, to Abraham. Uh, and here King David was, king of a united Israel. But sadly, it didn't last too long. Under his son Solomon, it divided into two kingdoms, confusingly, one called Israel and one called Judah. The northern kingdom uh, was uh, known as Israel and the southern kingdom as Judah. And those two kingdoms, what happened over then the centuries that followed the United Kingdom of Israel under King David was was a division. These two kingdoms split over disagreements and what and then that made them more susceptible to other empires that might want to take over. So over the, the next 500 years, the northern kingdom got uh, taken over by the Assyrians. And that's the, what happened to the southern kingdom, Judah is that they are then left uh, to their own devices. Judah was taken over eventually by the Babylonians. And the Babylonians then kick the people of Israel out of Judah and they are exiled. Well, what happens after that is that the Persians get involved. The Persian Empire comes in, swoops in, kicks out the Babylonians and where we join Nehemiah, and in fact, Ezra as well, they are to be read together, uh, is that they have been invited back 50 years after they've been kicked out by the Babylonians. They've been invited back by King Cyrus of the Persian Empire to come home again, to come out of exile again. Here they are, travelling back, invited back, to rebuild the devastated Jerusalem that the Babylonians essentially burnt to the ground. The temple had been destroyed. The city was ransacked. Their home needed to be rebuilt. They were coming out of exile into a new future, but one that was familiar, but still needed to be rebuilt. And so over the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, and you can go into it in more detail, I recommend uh, going to the Bible Project on YouTube. It will give you a summary of the whole thing, more than I can do uh, today. Uh, but in Ezra and Nehemiah, they, they look at the uh, uh, Zerubbabel, and then 60 years later, Ezra and Nehemiah. And we're going to pick up some themes from Nehemiah over the next few weeks. And Nehemiah was committed to the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah himself was a, an Israelite serving under 
King Cyrus and he requested to King Cyrus that he go about this project of rebuilding uh, the walls. King Cyrus not only obliged but gave him some armed uh, soldiers to help protect him as he did the rebuilding. And there are two halves of Nehemiah. The first half is the rebuilding of the walls and the second half uh, and that rebuilding of the walls, by the way, came with significant opposition, which we'll be looking at over the next few weeks. And the second half is Ezra and Nehemiah working together for the spiritual renewal of Jerusalem. You see, the walls and the rebuilding of the walls was not for their own sake, but they were to serve the spiritual renewal of the city. The people of Israel were returning from exile to rebuild the lives that they once knew a few decades before. Not a few months, but a few decades. Nehemiah is part of the rebuilding alongside Zerubbabel and Ezra. But the question they're all asking is, how do they rebuild their lives? And at the centre of it, what does it look like for people who call themselves followers of Jesus, believers in God, to rebuild our lives in such a way that we see the spiritual renewal of our lives and the lives of those around us? So we're going to pick up some lessons from Nehemiah, because as we rebuild our lives, what are the principles that we can take from this this ancient world that is in our Christian scriptures to speak to us today. And so today I want to look at the foundations. Of course, in any rebuilding project, the foundations come first. The first foundation that we see at work in Nehemiah is the foundation of perspective. For you, what happens when life goes wrong? What happens when life has its challenges or that you're facing an insurmountable future? Maybe you're overwhelmed or paralysed. Maybe you stick your head in the sand. Maybe you try and wrestle control, pull every lever you can. I know that I seek to do that a lot of the time as well. Nehemiah, knowing the size of the task ahead of him, builds foundations, not literally, but spiritually, in terms of his perspective. His foundations are firm that enables him to deal with the size of the task ahead of him, to deal with the opposition that he faces as he rebuilds those walls. And his perspective is looking at the character of God, who God is, the character of God and the promises of God. Some examples for you. Chapter 1, uh, verse 5. He prays, and as he prays, he says, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. This is the first chapter, the fifth verse, and already we have a sense of Nehemiah's perspective is focused on the God who is above all things great and awesome he is in heaven it echoes if you like for us the prayer that Jesus taught us our father in heaven it places God other than us yes he draws close to us but he is other he is almighty he is able to do more than we could ask or imagine he's not a pocket mascot he is a God that is to be worshipped and glorified he has a perspective He has a perspective. Verse six continues. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. In verse six, he not only continues his prayer from verse five as placing God as other, but in the light of who God is, he sees who he is. He is a servant of the living God. He has a perspective on who God is. And that thread is woven all the way through Nehemiah. Like I said, we're not going to be able to go through it verse by verse. But that thread of perspective is critical to the rebuilding that Nehemiah uh, is involved with. Not only that, but his perspective is not only uh, uh, seen by the character of God, but it's also the promises of God. In verse uh, uh, verse 8 of chapter 1, he looks back 
at the way that God had been faithful in the past. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, uh, Nehemiah prays, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for, the, for my name. He calls upon the fulfilled promises of God. And in that, he gets his perspective. You see, when we're looking at rebuilding our lives, one of the foundation stones is our perspective in who we are and who God is. God is not our packet, pocket mascot. He is our almighty God. He is the one at the end of time where every tribe and tongue, every nation, every king, every president, every every leader will bow the knee in worship. That perspective shaped by his view on the character of God, who God is and the promises of God, what he has done enables Nehemiah to place his trust in God despite the insurmountable task ahead of him you see it's true of us as people isn't it that actually we trust people based on two main things we trust people based on who they are what we know of them and we trust people based on what they have done in the past it's been said before of human beings that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior so if we're to extrapolate that to a perfect almighty God, then surely we're to look at a God who has fulfilled his promises and has always come through. Maybe not in the way that we would expect, but he has always come through for us. Looking back at who God is and the promises that he has fulfilled gives us a reassurance for the future. God is unchanging. He's utterly consistent. And, and, and when we think of God as inconsistent, maybe when we read our scriptures, it's really only because we, if we're honest, have shaped God in our image. The kind of God that we would really like rather than the God that's presented to us here. Because when we see the character of God and the promises of God, our starting point is here in the word of God. It is the revealed word of God to reveal who God is and his promises that give us that perspective. In fact, Nehemiah knows this so much. You know, we talked about these two halves of Nehemiah, the first half being about the building of the walls and the second half of Nehemiah being about what happens when those walls are built. For what purpose are they there for? Well, it's about the spiritual renewal of their own lives and the lives of those around them. But Nehemiah begins chapter eight, the second half, the beginning of the second half of Nehemiah, by reading the law, that that was the scripture that they had in their hands at the time. they reading the law and, and calling the people of Israel back to first principles. To know who God is uh, and to know his promises that have been fulfilled, we are first to come here to his revealed word of God. There's no point really in, in seeking our own experiences without the foundation stone of this, scripture itself. And I know it has its complications, but it is to wrestle with uh, God as we read his word together. It's not to read it blindly, it's to read it well. But that helps us get a perspective, a foundation stone of perspective as we look to rebuilding our lives, to build our lives on that perspective informed by the promises and character of God as revealed in Scripture. Second thing that we have is that we want to build our foundations on the perspective and on prayer. On prayer. See, when you're faced with a challenge in life, do you first go to prayer or do you instead go to practicalities? I know for me, if I've got a busy day ahead, it'll be really hard to squeeze in a time of prayer. Just being honest with you today. But actually, prayer is the foundational part of what we see at work here in Nehemiah. We see prayer woven all the way through. I, I began reading just earlier a bit of the prayer in chapter one. We see it in uh, chapter two, verse four. Uh, there's a little mini prayer. We say, Nehemiah said, then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. 
a little prayer as he's dialoguing with the king as to this rebuilding project that he's about to engage in. We see a prayer in chapter six, uh, verse 19, when he's facing um, opposition. And we see that all the way through. A lot of chapter nine is a prayer. Prayer is woven all the way through. It's a foundational part. The fact that Nehemiah as a book begins with a long prayer tells us everything about when we're trying to rebuild our lives. Do we go to our bank account, to our career progression? Do we go to our house move or do we go to prayer? Because that's what we see in Nehemiah, that despite the insurmountable task ahead of him, prayer is foundational. This week, uh, I attended virtually the leadership conference that HDB put on uh, uh, online. And they had an interview there featuring uh, Nikki Gumbel interviewing Francis Collins, uh, an eminent uh, scientist, one of the greatest of his generation, if not um, more than that. He was the leader of the Human Genome Project. He, he currently is uh, the director of the Institutes of Health. In fact, he's been appointed that by three separate presidents in the States. But he's also a man of faith. And his role over the last year, Dr. Fauci has been reporting to him in terms of their response to COVID and all the challenges that they face over in the US. He apparently has been working 100 hour weeks to make sure that as many lives can be saved as possible. But he's a man of faith. And what that's meant is that at 5 a.m., he's begun his day in prayer and reading scripture. You'd think leading a, 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 the nation of America through the response to COVID. You'd think that he wouldn't have any hours in the day. It shames me when I think how busy my day is and I think about his day. And yet he carves that time out for prayer. You see, the two are also interrelated. Those foundations of perspective and of prayer enable us to build our lives because perspective leads us to prayer. When we see who God is and therefore who we are, we recognise that we have to get on our knees and pray. In fact, what's interesting is that it actually also leads us to a place of confession. How often when we plan our lives and we think about rebuilding, do we put ourselves first, our needs first, the things that we really want to do and we kind of don't even give God a cursory nod. But here we have in chapter one again, that prayer leads Nehemiah to confession. And he confesses the sins of the Israelites. He says, including myself and my father's house in verse six. We have acted very quickly towards you, wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed your commands, decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. See, the perspective leads us to our knees in prayer, recognises who we are as servants of a living God, in a God that loves us and welcomes us. Those foundations are the beginning of our rebuilding, the perspective and the prayer. So what about you? Is your God big enough? Do you trust the foundations of that perspective and that prayer? Or if you're honest, would you rather go your own way when it comes to rebuilding a new future as we emerge out of lockdown? I'm going to hand over to uh, your cell group leader or indeed the, the guys leading the service at church to pray for us now. Amen.